good day to everyone who joined us wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar uh, titled Riding Straight to Democracy, Spread of Disinformation in Social Media. My name is Ching En Wu and I am a research fellow at Academia Sinica and in Taiwan. The webinar is sponsored by Asian Democracy Research Network and the EAI in South Asia. It's part of the Democratic Cooperation Series. And uh, we have a group of excellent panelists. Let me first introduce then First, we have uh, Michael Ichihara. She's an associate professor of Hitobashi University in Japan. And next, we have Su Zhong Li. She's a professor of Sun King Wan University. And she is also a senior fellow at the East Asia Institute. Then we have Francisco Mango, Mangano, and uh, she teach at the De La Salle University in Philippines. And uh, she is, he is also a research fellow at the Jace Roberto Institute of Governance. Next, we have Shiri Nuyati. She is a sen senior researcher at the Center for Political Study at the Indonesian Institute of Science. Then we have Kustov and Kanti. Um, uh, he is a director and the social society for participate participatory research in Asia. And finally, we have Asia Rights, and uh, she is the joint director, Japan uh, Pakistan Institute of Legislative Development and uh, Transparency. And uh, in this webinar, we are going to discuss the challenge that the democracy face and. Uh, post by the spread of this information and then we will share idea to pursue the right balance between protecting freedom of speech and the curbing misinformation. And uh, I want to briefly uh, say the format of our event. First, each speaker will offer a 10 minutes presentation. Then we want to have a Q&A section for approximately 20 minutes and uh, so thank you all for joining us and uh, Makio, I will turn it to you. Thank you very much, Jinan. Um, my name is Michael Ijihara, Associate Professor at Hitotsubashi University, Japan, a visiting scholar at um, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace uh, in the United States and study team co-director of the Democracy for the Future project at the Japan Center for International Exchange. Um, while the theme of this webinar is disinformation on the social media, my presentation uh, is a bit um, of outlier. And my topic uh, is information campaign on the internet, focusing on China's information manipulation in Japan. Authoritarian states have been using disinformation and propaganda campaigns to manipulate public opinion and to disrupt democratic processes worldwide. Studies of this phenomena abound, from Russian election meddling in the US to Chinese political interference in Australia. However, despite being an open society with crucial geopolitical position, Japan has been understudied on this front and seemingly has skated mostly unscathed. Limited existing studies conducted by scholars such as Russell Chow and Devin Stewart have discovered China's influence activities via diaspora organizations, Japan-China exchange organizations, and Confucius Institutes, among others. But Stewart argues that China's influence activities have limited impact in Japan. While his argument is that Japan's relatively closed democracy is the factor which has limited China's infiltration, the limited influence of China in their studies seems more to do with the fact that these particular organizations studied so far do not have dense contact 
with the population in Japan in general. Thus, in my recent study as a part of ADRN, I evaluated Japanese language news sites that disseminate information related to China through Japanese news aggregator sites, which widely reach the Japanese audience. Though nominally independent and based in Japan, I found that at least one of them, Record China, is indirectly controlled by the Chinese Communist Party and that it has promoted manipulated content in an effort to push pro-China narratives. A close evaluation of this site shows that Japan may have been subject to more information operations than previously thought. China's information campaign in Japan reflects the particular habits of Japanese internet users. The vast majority of the Japanese citizens get their news primarily from internet sites and television, in addition to newspapers, instead of social media. The most common form of accessing online news is through news aggregator sites like Yahoo News, which curate content from hundreds of news sites. Chinese actors have taken note of these consumption trends and have structured their influence operations accordingly, using news aggregators to push Chinese linked content to a wide audience. While aggregators often screen contributors for reliability and professionalism, stories from pro-China outlets pass through the screen and are routinely posted on many of Japan's leading news sites. Established by a Chinese fil filmmaker in 2005, Tokyo-based Record China originally specialized in the sales of pictures but commenced news aggregation in 2006. In a significant proportion of its stories feature strong political messages. They have in, uh, invariably, they, uh, these have invariably parroted the Chinese government's stance. The Uyghur issue is a good example. Despite a shared concern in the Japanese media of serious human rights violations by the Chinese government, Record China has pushed party line content, which depicts Uyghurs as terrorists. Of 24 articles published on Uyghur issues in Record China in 2019, for example, none mentioned human rights issues, though 11 paraphrase the Chinese government's official position. This pattern is not limited to hot button issues. Using quantitative text analysis, I examined what sources Record China stories cited and how the stories paired descriptors with key terms. Despite the name of the news site being Record China, much of the news content from the company is either on China or on South Korea. And when it comes to China related news, Record China relies almost exclusively on Chinese sources all of which are controlled or heavily influenced by the CCP. Among them, 55.5% of its articles cite Chinese state media. Why does South Korea related news have some important values for record China? It turned out that it has promoted a positive view of the Japan-China relations and a starkly negative view of relations between Japan and Korea. In 2019, Record China's most, most covered Korea-related topics included thorny diplomatic issues like boycotts of Japanese products, comfort women, export disputes, and the General Security of Military Information Agreement, or GSOMIA. In contrast, despite the existence of disputes between Japan and China, such as territorial and cybersecurity issues that year, Record China reported virtually only positive non political content on Japan China issues. The most popular topics were sports, celebrities, and trade. 
This sharp contrast mirrors China's general goal of dividing the region's strongest democracies and promoting pro-China views within the domestic population. They might also have aimed to polarize the Japanese society along a social cleavage between supporters and opponents of human rights protection for people who have roots in foreign countries. Though registered in Japan, registration data show that Record China's, um, Record China's uh, is indirectly controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. With the help of the double, double link lab in Taiwan, I discovered that Record China has an internet domain in China, which is sponsored by the Shenzhong Online Technology Corporation. Shenzhong's majority shareholder is Panacea Information and Tech, a firm controlled by CCP official Yan Jianao. Yan is both a deputy to the Wuxi Municipal People's Congress and a member of the Chinese People's Consultative Conference which is an extension of the United Front Work Department of the Chinese Communist Party. The United Front Work Department oversees intelligence and influence activities abroad. It is clear then that the CCP has worked its way into the Japanese media landscape. Although pro-China content might have limited influence due to the strong negative sentiment toward China in Japan, Anti-Korea content would resonate with the narratives of the internet right wings and thus would have much more influence. CCP's subtle manipulation poses a serious challenge to the integrity of the Japanese media landscape and must be addressed head on. Japanese citizens must recognize that Japan is not immune to manipulation. It is already being subjected to such operations. To counter this, new segregators must become more vigilant in reviewing the content they promote. In addition, the result of this study implies that China might be in instigating anti-Korea sentiment through other news outlets as well. China may be mani manipulating information to inst instigate anti-Japan sentiment in South Korea too. Further research, research is warranted about China's information activities in both Japan and South Korea. Whether they use disinformation should be also examined. Japan and South Korea are two major democracies and quasi allies in the region, and their cooperation is essential in maintaining peace, stability, rule of law, and freedom in Asia. We must respond before it is too late. Thank you very much. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Michael. I think it's a very uh, interesting and important case study that uh, we often do not pay attention to. And we often pay attention to the case in Taiwan and Hong Kong, and we don't know the the influence of China, China's fake news armies also try to sway the Japanese. So I think it's a very uh, important studies. And uh, I think the, and also it affect not only the Chinese, uh, Japan's domestic politics and also seek to influence how Japanese uh, view South Korea and probably South Korea view uh, Japan in the other side. So I think it's a very important uh, 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 research. Probably you can, if you can, you can probably provide some uh, uh, the empirical evidence that how many people, how many Japanese actually read the, the, the content made in China, for example, about South Korea and uh, then you can prove that uh, better proof that uh, the Japanese are influenced by those content and uh, change their attitude toward uh, South Korea. Yeah, that's my uh, short uh, comments. And uh, so next we told we turn to uh, Shu Zhong Li. 
Hello. <clears throat> this is Suk Jung, Lee Suk Jung from Seoul, South Korea. Um, I'm going to talk about rise of political social media in South Korea. And before I start, uh, two cases of uh, disinformation and then uh, political polarization, let me uh, talk uh, more general background. As we all recall, the social media has emerged as a very important liberation technology, uh, uniting democratic forces and then many uh, dissidents to stand up against authoritarian governments, as we have seen in 2011 Jasmine Revolution. I think that function of a liberation technology still continues uh, in South Korea as well. At the same time, from the past several years, uh, since the uh, last several years, we've been seeing the rise of negative functions of uh, social media um, threatening democracy rather than assisting or promoting democracy. Um, the Omedia group uh, has uh, articulated uh, serious negative functions of social media threatening democracy as the following. Number one, exacerbating the polarization of civil society via echo chamber phenomenon. Number two, spreading myths and disinformation. And three, amplifying populist and illiberal discourse. Four, capturing huge amounts of user data that can be used to manipulate the user uh, behaviors. And lastly, uh, facilitating hate speeches. And of course, and I can reflect which aspect of this negative functions of social media uh, is operating in South Korea. But I will say um, uh, the uh, hate speeches and um, the this uh, uh, data uh, the theft uh, all these things are less common. Uh, rather than, um, and also disinformation is not that prevalent. So I will say the amplifying effect of uh, political polarization is the most serious challenges for political uh, social media in South Korea. And let me explain the general background of South Korea. As you may know, South Korea is a very strong IT country with a very excellent uh, information technology infrastructure, and um, most of people use smartphone. But uh, as we seen in the case of Japan, um, most of the Koreans uh, rely on television news or other uh, established media when they are receiving the, the news for the first time. However, um, so they got the news uh, through social media, only three or four percent. However, still social media is very important as a second layer of uh, the, this political um, communications. And especially with this uh, social media, we've been seeing in South Korea, uh, the celebrities can speak on political issues. There are politicians, writers, and public intellectuals, and they <clears throat> make comments on political um, happenings, current uh, issues. And the established media usually um, comment back to this uh, political comments made on the social media. So actually, uh, the, there is no sharp division between established media and then social media. Um, I think why the social media has become important for political communication is, is because many people distrust the conventional media. So for example, um, during the conservative government, uh, the many progressive intellectuals and politicians uh, in the, uh, uploaded many comments in Twitter. So Twitter was dominated by progressive commentators. And now under the liberal government, YouTube uh, became a hub of conservative political uh, comment commentators. 
so it's a very interesting phenomenon, you know, because many believe, especially people who do not trust the current government, tend to think the established all these licensed medias can be regulated by the government, so they cannot criticize government uh, in a sharp way. So uh, as a substitute, social media is offering a kind of political space for critics uh, to speak uh, against the, the uh, ruling force and, and incumbent government. Um, and, and then, Um, then let me focus on uh, two cases. Number one is disinformation case. Number two is political polarization case. For the disinformation case, actually, um, there is no sharp distinction between fact and fake news because we live the era of a post-truth. So there is the truth is always interpreted and facts are interpreted. So therefore, this in, there are so many interpreted news and, and, and everybody's claiming those interpreted news are actually facts. Uh, and the problem is many people buy into that kind of interpreted news. If it's an intentional, then we call disinformation. However, just the uh, misconceived truths, facts, um, without vicious intention, we simply say that's misinformation, right? So uh, this is always difficult to, to distinguish because we have to prove whether there is a very um, a negative intentions to manipulate the opinion. Okay, um, in the case of these informations, um, there are two famous cases that happened during the election time. Uh, the, num the first case is 2012, the National Intelligence Service uh, Tor scandal. Uh, we have a NIS, um, the Government Intelligence Service, and they usually have a certain section uh, dedicated to psychological warfare. And then uh, during the 2012 election, uh, the chief of uh, NIS got involved in using the NIS's uh, staff to upload uh, uh, the ne negative commentary um, in social media against liberal candidate. Uh, uh, at the time, our current uh, president, Moon Jae-in, he was the, the candidate from the Progressive Party. So this became a very huge scandal and uh, that uh, had led to the imprisonment of NIS chief. And then uh, five years later in 2017, uh, presidential election, and this time the pro-Moon um, blogger uh, named uh, Mr. Kim, uh, he uh, uploaded, uh, uh, he used actually kind of a machine. So the, so the machine can, we call macro, uh, this machine can just uh, click the like button very easily because it's not human is doing, it's a machine is doing. Uh, and to sway uh, the favorable opinion toward uh, the liberal candidate uh, during the 2017 election time. And, and here, uh, this blogger claimed that the governor, uh, Kim kyung soo who is close to our president, uh, had colluded with him. So that has led to kind of um, trial of Governor Kim and, and, and it, the case is still going on. So um, these two disinformation cases uh, during the election time, uh, I will say are most famous uh, cases, um, but I don't know because it's very interesting whether uh, there is outside inf infiltration to influence public opinion of South Korea as uh, Michael has uh, presented uh, like uh, to in order to wedge between 
uh, Japan and South Korea, uh, or USA and South Korea, who knows? So we need to check whether there is the kind of external actors interventions in opinion leaking uh, using social media. Okay, and then let's move to polarization case. In South Korea, uh, civil society and political society are sharply divided, like as you've seen in the United States. Uh, so, so therefore, social media in this uh, polarized political setting play a perfect role as an echo chamber or a filter bubble. So uh, people you know, who share the same political opinions uh, tend to communicate why they are, you know, do not listening to whatever the other party, other first is saying. Uh, so therefore, uh, th this is this does not stop as a, just a biased, uh, divided communication. Most serious thing is that um, uh, it is uh, affecting uh, party politics too, because very staunch, very strong opinionated uh, uh, supporters or opponents of a president and other political leaders rely on social media to form a political coalition who share the same views. Once this collision is successfully made, it became very viral. And every conventional newspapers report about this claim. So therefore, in a way, this noise studied from the social media is affecting the conventional media and the parties. Then parties tend to align with this uh, supporters with a very strong opinion. So therefore, that is uh, a narrowing the middle ground or, or common ground for political compromise between two forces. So uh, this is a very serious uh, a political problem at this moment in South Korea. So there is a very difficult uh, for the opposing political forces to communicate to each other and, and to deliberate each other uh, and, and they become like an enemy uh, for each other. This is very dangerous sign. So I would say that's very uh, bad uh, uh, things that is happening to South Korea. Because my time is running up, uh, let me uh, wrap up this way. Then what to do about this? And of course, uh, South Korean government knows about this issue and we have a uh, umbrella law called Law on Promoting Information Communication and Protecting Information. Information. It's a long name. And this is a kind of uh, umbrella regulatory law since 1986. And the law has been devised several times in order to respond to these problems in social media. But that's not enough. And when um, the Lee Myung Bak government uh, see, saw the problem, they tried to, to regulate this uh, SNS space, but wasn't successful. And instead, the Korean portal companies came with this idea of self-regulations. So therefore, we have a Korea Internet Self-Governance Organization called KISO um, that was launched in 2009 and they tried to regulate with their own rules. So some are effective, some are not, of course. Um, so therefore, uh, since the self-regulation of internet companies um, is not sufficient, I will suggest three things. First, um, we need a very smart balance between uh, guaranteeing freedom of expression and at the same time, the protecting uh, the privacy and, uh, and, and regulating uh, these informations. So we need a very wise, uh, very targeting detailed uh, rules and laws. And number two, we need the principles and practices to sort out facts and because everybody's claiming this is fact and we need to bridge conflicting views in order to overcome this post-truth era. And lastly, we need a civic digital education and deliberation training 
So to every uh, the social media users uh, should be aware of uh, this uh, dangerous functions of social media. So I will stop here. Okay. Okay, thank you, um, Professor Li, Shu Zhong Li. And I think it's a very good uh, uh, case study that uh, demonstrate how uh, the use of uh, uh, social media can uh, further exaggerate the already polarized society. And uh, so the, the use of social media use increase the spread of misinformation, then it further increase the political polarization. And I think, and the, the article, the presentation also mentioned a very important role of uh, mass media. I think it's very interesting. He mentioned, she mentioned about the interaction between uh, mass media and uh, social media, and uh, they tend to exaggerate the situation. So the, I think the role of mass media is very critical. If they can some way, in some way, play the uh, gatekeeper role that uh, try to um, eliminate or reduce some of the uh, misinformation, misinform fake news, then uh, it can greatly reduce the adverse impact of the, the uh, fake news, I think. So now it's, uh, uh, we, we have two first two presenters from Northeast Asia. Now we will turn to uh, Southeast Asia. First, we will uh, have the Francisco Magno from Philippines. Thank you. My uh, talk would uh, focus on social media in the case of historical revisionism in the Philippines. I would like to start by saying that social media has evolved into a major platform for exerting political influence in the Philippines. This is not so surprising considering that Filipinos are heavy users of the internet and social media. According to 2019 data, they spent a daily average of 10 hours in cyberspace. An estimated 71% of the population use social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The amount of time expended by Filipinos in social media amounted to four hours and 12 minutes each day in last year. It was not unexpected for politics to take root in social media. In the Philippines, the strength of social media as a platform for mobilizing political support became especially evident during elections. During the 2016 polls, a vigorous social media campaign was launched that helped the eventual winner of the presidency. That campaign employed a volunteer-driven strategy that relied on social media influencers to spread the campaign's populist message to a wide band of followers. The digital influencers in election campaigns can be anonymous or key opinion leaders. And name operators have marching orders to convert specific campaign lines into viral political messages. On the other hand, key opinion leaders include celebrities and online pundits with a large following. So it's a combination of uh, people who are known. These are celebrities, actors, actresses, musicians, singers, plus those who work behind the scenes. So these are case of electronic troll, electronic troll farms. The intense cultivation of social media platforms for electoral purposes did not start in the 2016 polls. So we should go back to the prior national election, specifically use for the Senate run in 2010 by Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr. He is the son and namesake of the late president who imposed martial law from 1972 until 1986, when a people power revolution led the family to go into exile in Hawaii. Eventually, members of the family returned to the country and ran in elections. 
while winning handily in local and congressional races with votes from their home province, family members lost in their bid for national elective posts. Imelda Marcos, widow of President Marcos, ran unsuccessfully for the highest office in 1992, while Bongbong Marcos lost his bid to be a senator in 1995. So we would notice that the first two attempts of the Marcos family to get back into national politics were unsuccessful. But they started early. So Imelda Marcos ran in the first presidential election um, after uh, martial law was removed. Apparently, the Marcos clan needed to refurbish its image in the eyes of the nation if they are to reverse its losing streak in national elections. The dark accounts of economic plunder and human rights transgressions had to be glossed over by a counter narrative that speaks instead of a golden age of history under the Marcos regime. Such historical revisionism was pursued through an enormous propaganda and disinformation drive waged by a vast network of websites, Facebook pages, and social media groups, YouTube channels, and social media influencers. The contrived content that was fed into the social media machinery systematically denied the corruption and abuse while exaggerating the achievements made during the Marcos years and denigrated critics, rivals, and mainstream media. The social media campaign paid off as Bongbong Marcos was elected senator in 2010. So the second time to run for senator the son of Ferdinand Marcos was successful. So he became senator in 2010. So that was the, the start of a really aggressive use of social media. So there was an attempt to run for a higher office as vice president in 2016. So the Marcos son lost by a narrow margin. It was her sister, Amy Marcos, turn to run for senator and won in the 2019 elections. The Marcoses are back in the national saddle. The political fortunes of the Marcos children rose as the rehabilitation of the late President Marcos from dictator to hero continues. Despite protests from victims of martial law, the remains of the Marcos patriarch were buried in the Libingan ng mga bayani, or the cemetery of heroes. The deliberate effort to provide a glorious depiction of martial law for political ends was facilitated through network disinformation. This refers to the organized production of political deception that allocates responsibilities to diverse or loosely interconnected groups of hierarchies, digital workers. In the Philippines, this information is is embedded as an organized industry where major players from the marketing and strategic communication sector render political consultancy services. So it has become a big industry. So it provides uh, employment for a lot of uh, people. The architecture of network disinformation is composed and led by elite advertising and public relations firms who deal with political clients. Mostly these are unseen hands deftly orchestrating operations to pursue a multitude of political strategies anchored on the use of big data and social media. Investigative reports that had come out about how data analytics firms like Cambridge Analytica were able to harvest data from social media platforms like Facebook to develop new election strategies and tactics that are products of behavioral micro-targeting, micro psychographic profiling, and predictive analytics. Big data analytics are used to rebrand electoral candidates in ways that would appeal to the voters. Social media strategies are now fully centralized and integrated in the overall campaign of candidates from the national to the local levels. 
So it has become a regular item. So having a social media strategies in a political campaign, in an election campaign, is now very uh, widespread in the country. Populist leaders have engaged social media to spread their anti-establishment discourse that includes the rejection of the legitimacy of prevailing democratic rules, dismissal of mainstream media, and corruption allegations against liberal institutions that protect civil liberties and human rights. In the Philippines, the pursuit of this information through social media has further strengthened personality-based politics and weakened rules-based governance. So as a conclusion, I would like to say that precisely by using social media as a campaign platform, especially in elections, although it, didn't, it doesn't stop after, let's say, the victory of an election candidate, so it continues, the social media campaign continues. What this has resulted is in the lessening of the influence of political parties. While there are still political parties, they tend to uh, converge in the administration party. So it has tended to weaken the strength of opposition parties. So it has become personality, personality based politics and in the end weakened rules-based governance. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Okay, thank you, Francisco. I think it's a very clear description of how uh, the use of the rise of social media, fake news, will affect uh, the functional democracy. And uh, first of all, you describe the close relationship between populism and the social media how populist leader can use social media to help his rise. And then uh, you mentioned about the whitewashing process of a formal, former authoritarian leader. And I think whitewashing and the rewriting history are common in many countries. But in your presentation, it suggests that uh, uh, the use of social media and the misinformation can help ease or facilitate the, the process. So I think that's uh, uh, very interesting it's that uh, uh, social media can play such an important uh, uh, role in help those uh, former authoritarian leaders and their offspring, they can help them to rise again. I think that's very interesting. And you also mentioned the impact on democracy. I think that are also very persuasive. So now we next we turn to Sri Nayati from Indonesia. Okay. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, and also good night uh, in wherever you are. Uh, my name is Sri Nuryanti. I'm from the Indonesian Institute of Sciences. Today, I would like to uh, talk about social media, disinformation, and democracy in the uh, year 2019 simultaneous election in Indonesia. Um, the presence of social media uh, has a strong influence on political event in Indonesia, especially in the year 2018 to 2019. This is due to the spread of information that increased significantly prior to the 2019 simultaneous election in Indonesia that was uh, held on April 17, uh, 2019. A lot of news was distributed on social media, including in disinformation, hoax, and fake news. Based on various analysis, disinformation massively target the candidates and the general election commission. I think this is uh, something that different from uh, the rest of the world. In Indonesia, the disinformation also targeting the general election uh, commission or electoral management uh, body. The spread of uh, disinformation mainly occurred during campaign period and the disinformation effort aimed to president and vice president candidate uh, falsely accused that candidate 
uh, doing a bad thing. The expected result was to defeat the target, targeted candidate. So uh, as uh, the uh, main research questions of uh, today uh, presentation was uh, three things. How disinformation targeting the General Election Commission aim to undermine the election and in turn uh, disadvantage the incumbent. Second, how disinformation targeting two candidates uh, of the election, especially for presidential and uh, vice president's uh, elect, uh, candidates, aim to shift the voting preference of the public and how social media and disinformation disrupted the political process in the uh, in simultaneous election in Indonesia uh, 2019. So uh, if we have a look at the figure of uh, social uh, media users, in January 2019, uh, it is reported that in Indonesia, we have uh, more than 150 million people, uh, friendly uh, users of uh, social media. And uh, at the same time, they also uh, make report that uh, the time they spend with the social media was more than eight hours a day. So I think this is a very, uh, uh, a very high profile where we can uh, see the uh, justification that uh, media has strong influence in the political event. As I said earlier that um, in 2019, there was an increasing broadcast disinformation in the social media related to uh, election that was held uh, last year in April. The disinformation were targeting the vice president, uh, the president and vice president candidates, and also the general election, and it was especially spread during campaign period, which is six months and three weeks. So in Indonesia, we have a very long uh, campaign period. In this case, uh, we are uh, uh, talking about six months and three weeks uh, campaign period. The aim and purpose of the disinformation to candidates actually purposely uh, for defeating the contestant, falsely accuse the candidate of doing a bad things, and then purpose, uh, purposefully to shift the voting preference of the people. So if the people knows that uh, uh, the candidates was accused of doing a bad things, therefore uh, it is uh, targeting that uh, voting preference of the people later on will uh, shift to other contestants. And the uh, disinformation that proposed and targeted to uh, General Election Commission was trying to undermine the process of uh, election so that elected uh, president will have low legitimacy. And also it will also give multiplier uh, effect towards the uh, incumbent. If the elect election is not trusted, therefore there will be a multi multiplier effect that expected to happen, uh, uh, such as to the incumbent and also trying to uh, 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 to make a, a situation chaotic. The disinformation targeting to the candidates actually uh, in Indonesia, as you may know already, that Indonesia is uh, mostly inhabited by uh, Muslim uh, people. Therefore, pork is is a sensitive thing. One of uh, the targeted uh, disinformation towards the candidate or the supporters of the candidate is one of the election, uh, one of the uh, political party chief was saying that after the election is done, then we will going to eat bakmi. Bakmi is a noodle. But in the disinformation case, it says that instead of uh, we eat, going to eat bakmi, uh, they said that uh, we will going to eat babi. Babi is pork. Therefore, it stir up the situation towards the disinformation and it affect um, it trying to affect uh, people preference. One other thing that uh, targeting the candidates is um, uh, there was a, a black campaign towards the vice president's uh, candidate. Uh, 
uh, Ma'ruf Amin. Profesor Ma'ruf Amin is a Muslim ulama. Therefore, it will be uh, sensitive when he was uh, portraying as if that he was wearing the uh, Santa clothes. And this is also trying to uh, shift the voting preference of the uh, people. The disinformation targeting the general election commissions actually uh, on three things. First is on technical matters in which uh, during that time the disinformation that spread uh, as if there was a used ballot papers in seven containers found out in uh, one area in Jakarta. And then the use of cardboard uh, ballot boxes in which it is altering the use of uh, aluminum uh, ballot boxes. And it says that it is related to the um, uh, China influence. China is becoming a little bit of sensitive issue in this case. So the second thing is sensitive issues relating to Chinese. Even the chairman of the election commission was assumed to have a, a close relationship with Chinese. And it is also trying to uh, have a multiplier effect to shift the uh, uh, to shift the preference of the people and also to uh, spread uh, the bad news toward uh, Chinese. And the third thing, a disinformation targeting to the general election was uh, related to administering the voters. It says that uh, in the disinformation that spread during that uh, campaign period and during the uh, uh, election year in 2019, uh, EMB or election management bodies or general election commission fails to have accurate voter list. And there was also an accuse of administering Chinese foreign workers to be the uh, voters in which in this case, it is approved by the uh, holding of uh, Indonesian ID, which is similar to uh, the Indonesian ID, the, or, the ordinary Indonesian ID. The responses that was taken was uh, implementing the law on the use of electronic information and transaction and uh, from election commission and also from uh, government side actually uh, we try to turn back turn back hoax uh, campaign and uh, we are having cooperation with google and facebook to uh, turn down the uh, disinformation uh, news and uh, last but not least uh, some of case were brought to the court because of uh, it's really violate the uh, principles of uh, that regulate by the law on the use of electronic information and transaction. I think that's all. Uh, but um, before I end up my uh, presentation, actually, uh, from uh, this disinformation that happening in Indonesia, uh, the uh, disinformation, uh, uh, the social media has dual function. One is to educate people, but uh, other thing is also to spread the disinformation that it it turn it is hoped that after the spreading of disinformation it influence the uh, political lives of Indonesia uh, during the uh, election period in 2019. I think that's all. Chen Wu, thanks uh, for uh, listening. Okay, thank you, Sari. I think it's very interesting, and you mentioned the uh, uh, the use of social media and the rising misinformation uh, target the uh, the political candidates and also the general electoral commission, and uh, to defeat try to defeat the, the other candidate and try to de le legitimate the the electoral. Uh, candidate commission so i think that's uh, 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 very interesting uh, tell us to know that that uh, misinformation misinformation not only affect the the politician or party but it also try to influence the integrity or yeah. the image of the the electoral system and the, the government agency. So I mm -hmm. think the 
relate to this, I think the building a uh, uh, independent general election committee and uh, probably uh, some prof uh, to foster professional non-political bureaucracy yeah. would be important to reduce the effect of the fake news attack. And also you mentioned China. I think China seems to be the one of the big elephant in the room. And uh, on the one hand, it does influence the try to manipulate the uh, the information in many countries. But on the other hand, in some country, uh, the China factor seems to play that uh, uh, one side can accuse the other side for too close to China. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they become or generate some misinformation, fake news surrounding China. So I think that's also an interesting phenomenon that's uh, common to many countries in Asia. So now we turn to next uh, speakers. We will invite Kusto from India. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chinen. Um, and a very good morning to everyone uh, from Delhi. Um, a special word of thanks to the Asia Democracy Research Network Secretariat for organizing this webinar. Um, I am Kostu Bandopatai from Participatory Research in Asia based in uh, India. Today, uh, in my presentation, I'm going to share a couple of thoughts uh, on the impact of disinformation on Indian polity and society. I'll talk um, broadly five things. One, the context in which this dis or misinformation phenomena is unfolding in India. Second, the elusive accountability question. Third, the menace that it has created, particularly during the time of pandemic. And fourth, the impact of uh, impact on people and democracy. And uh, lastly, the possible way forward. So what is the context here? Uh, like most other countries, um, in India also, the popularity of social media platform has grown exponentially. Uh, it has democratized the media content in the sense that each one of us have become content creator, publisher, and opinion maker. Effectively, creating a system where the quality of published content can no longer be controlled. It has impacted almost every sphere of our lives, social, political, economic systems, and technology has made it even easier. As far as the misinformation or disinformation is concerned, among all the social media platforms, the market share for WhatsApp application is phenomenal with more than 400 million active users in India. And this number in increasing day by day, making it as one of the fastest growing uh, platform. A 2019 study by Microsoft found that over 64% of Indians encounter fake news online, the highest reported among the 22 countries surveyed. There are staggering number of edited images, manipulated videos, and fake text messages spreading through social media platforms and messaging services like WhatsApp, making it harder to distinguish between misinformation and credible fact. A significant portion of such messages revolves around the basic idea of nationalism and nation building fueled by a populist regime. In scenarios like this, where the main idea behind spreading news is related to nationalism, the facts become less important for the user than the emotional desire to bolster their national identity. From the various studies, it seems that Indians are more susceptible to fake news for a variety of reasons. Various scholars have tried to offer uh, many plausible explanation as to why are Indian more vulnerable to fake news. And some of these might include A, low digital literacy rate, B, rise of extremely polarized and divisive political 
religious and ethnic propaganda. C, most Indians access forwarded news from social media. And four, forwarding rate in India is the highest in the world. And Indians rely mostly on friends and families, which means there is no verification of the forwarded uh, news. So if that is the extent of problem, who should be held accountable? The answer to this question has been elusive so far. Is it the government, info intermediaries, the organization or person who creates and forwards mess messages to the media, uh, the, or the media which propagates such misinformation? Ideally, the answer should be all of the above. But let's see what government has done so far, other than periodically expressing their anguish. The first difficulty is that there is no one definition for fake news. What makes it a concern is that it allows subjective interpretation of the concept, thus making it difficult to study or allow any policy intervention. Fake news comprises of stories, news, and hoaxes created to misinform deliberately or deceive readers to push a particular political agenda. Until now, the government has put the onus of curbing fake news and misinformation on the social media intermediary. Time and again, the government has been asking social media sites to use technology to curb fake news and misinformation. On the other hand, until recently, uh, particularly the Facebook and Twitter, maintained a stance that these were platforms rather than publishers and therefore are not responsible for the content that is published on their platform. In 2018, a committee headed by the Home Secretary of India, Mr. Rajiv Gopa, recommended that India heads of the global internet and social media giants should face criminal proceedings if their platforms are used to propagate fake news or campaigns that incite violence that leads to riot and cases of lynching. However, the section 79 of the Information Technology Act 2000 provides for cases when the network service providers or intermediaries are not held liable. Recently, the Information and Broadcasting Ministry of the Government of India, through Broadcast Engineering Consultants India Limited, issued a tender to hire an agency to provide solutions and services to quote unquote identify key influence, influencers behind disinformation and their geolocation. In addition, the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology has proposed an information technology intermediary guidelines and guidelines for use of social media regulations 2020. A final draft of the rules is yet to be made public. Nevertheless, among other things, the draft proposed that the intermediary will have to deploy technology-based automated tools for proactively identifying and removing or disabling public access to unlawful information or content. It also required intermediaries to enable tracing out of the originator of information on its platform and share the information within 72 hours of government communi communication. Further, upon receiving knowledge about any objectionable content in the form of a court order, or on being notified by the appropriate government agency, the intermediary shall remove or disable access to unlawful content in less than 24 hours. As far as the spread of misinformation to WhatsApp is concerned, a few district authorities in a couple of Indian states notified that the administrator of the group will be held responsible. <coughs> However, the Delhi High Court challenged such notices by citing that holding administrators of the group liable for failing to regulate fake news and hate speech by deleting such posts from WhatsApp is impractical since there are no there are other uh, legal implications. So let me now focus on the uh, 
uh, menace of fake news at the time of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I, most of you would, would agree that fake news is traveling much faster than the coronavirus. Um, a group of researchers from the Michigan University studied the temporal pattern of COVID-19 related digital misinformation in India from January to April uh, this year. Based on their study, they have identified seven categories of misinformation. The first category relates to culture, which focuses on or, or made references to religious, ethnic, or social groups, or a popular cultural reference. Second, cure, prevention, and treatment, messages suggesting remedies, etc. Nature and the environment, messages that have reference to animals and the environment. Casualty, messages related to death, business and economy, government, and doctor statistics. So mis misrepresentation of comments, photos, and videos of political leaders, renowned doctors, business leaders, and celebrities have been rampantly spread on the social media to promote a conspiracy theory, blaming certain countries, groups, or communities for the spread of the virus. Several analyses suggest a couple of trends. First of all, two categories of misinformation have been rising consistently, storied about culture and the government. And this is due to a visible increase in stories around Muslims and COVID-19, as well as stories around police brutality. So let me clarify here. There was an alarming spike of misinformation around Muslims after the Tablighi Jamaat religious congregation that took place in Delhi's Nijamuddin uh, Markaz Mosque in early March 2020. An estimated 10,000 missionaries from various Indian states, as well as from 40 other countries, attended the event. Several thousands of them were reported to be infected with coronavirus. This incident sparked a plethora of misinformation blaming the entire community, despite the fact that many Muslims also criticized the timing of the congregation. So a lot of misinformation intended to be effective around identity and emotion, rather than around facts that can be scientifically verified. The misinformation has moved to cultural elements that are harder to uh, uh, verify. Another trend is the use of politicians or institutions as a believable source for government-related misinformation. Whereas businesses are seen as more valuable means of misguiding a reader on cure or issues of the economy, likewise, celebrities are more likely to be used in the culture-related information, while formal institutions are more frequently used to help push doctored uh, uh, statistics. Often the mainstream media and well-known journalists have also caused spread of misinformation. This might be because of the poor editorial standards or an intention to increase number of footfalls or simply because of uh, ignorance. So there have been instances where cure and culture have been intertwined to have a greater in impact. So <clears throat> Uh, so what are the impacts on, on, uh, of fake news then on the democracy uh, and, and, and the society as a whole? We have seen increased incidents of mob violence, killings, and lynching fueled by misinformation, um, disharmony and violent face-off between religious communities and social groups, discrediting the history and historical figures, Polarization of the communities based on divisive politics, often fueled by the uh, mainstream uh, media. So let me conclude by saying what could be the possible ways to curb the manners of this fake news and who should do what. Uh, <clears throat> my first submission would be the government must enact appropriate legislation which hold the intermediaries accountable as well as the culprits without imposing further restriction on freedom of expression. 
Second, the industries must invest in developing and using technology to identify fake news and its origin. What is the role of the media? The media has to promote self-regulation and proactively discourage using fake news for news sensationalization. It has a role for raising greater public awareness and media must be playing that role. Lastly, the civil society and educational institution need to work towards increasing digital literacy and awareness by working with the fact checkers. So these are some of the submissions, some of the suggestions that we can put forward to various stakeholders um, in, this, in this era of uh, disinformation. So let me stop here and I can come back when there are specific questions uh, to be answered. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Gustav. Uh, I think you mentioned very clearly that uh, everyone was involved in this uh, misinformation generation. It could be a creator, publisher, opinion maker, and uh, like the ordinary people and uh, mass media, government, politician, all get involved. And uh, you also mentioned a very interesting generalization about how uh, at what condition misinformation are likely to harm democracy. Like you say in India is an example of low digital literacy and the rise of extreme political and re religious groups. So those are the foundation. And also you mentioned the uh, people like to forward and read the news. Uh, those forward news. So those are the condition that uh, uh, the fake news and mis misinformation are most likely to uh, generate uh, riot or antagonism. I think this is a very good uh, general generalization. And for you, you mentioned that in India, people like to use WhatsApp and uh, that's the instant message service. Uh, versus the social media platform. I'm wondering what's the, the difference between the two and uh, the inference. How do they, how do this type of the social media uh, or electronic communicated mes mechanism will affect how, um, how misinformation are spread or inference the politics? And uh, you, another thing you mentioned, I think you mentioned about the definition of fake news. I think that's very important. Probably we, we need to have another webinar to discuss the definition of fake news. And uh, because there's no single definition and you probably, you mentioned at least two, one is the outright fabrication of story and image and uh, this one is more easily, this should be banned or removed. But how about the subjective interpretation of things or history? That one is more difficult. So I think we should have more discussion of the, the definition of the fake news it, because it affects how we should deal with them. Okay, so finally we move to Asaya riots from uh, Pakistan. Thank you very much, uh, Chinen. Um, uh, it's, and thank you very much, East Asia and Shoot. Uh, very interesting presentations on uh, what is the role of social media um, and, and how it's impacting democracy um, elsewhere. I'll be talking about the case of Pakistan. Uh, to start off, um, uh, the, the overview of where Pakistan stands, like everywhere else in the world, uh, the, there is a rise of uh, social media usage as the new communication tool. Um, it's a new communication tool that's used for uh, political purposes as well uh, and certainly has an impact on the sort of democracy that we have um, in Pakistan. But in order to be able to understand where we are um, as a country, uh, one needs to also understand what our peculiar realities are. Uh, so Pakistan, uh, to, I, can, I can share at the outset, uh, we do have legal regulations and an increasing focus of 
um, state, not just one political government, but the increasing focus of the state on more and more legal regulation, regulating uh, the use of social media. Um, there are, um, and this needs to be really understood in the context of Pakistan's own history. Uh, Pakistan has been battling uh, with the issue of terrorism over, over a long time. It is an issue which is um, under control increasingly now. Uh, but still, the regulation or the legal regulation on the use of social media really began in Pakistan because it's anti-state uh, actors and terrorists that really began using social media as a tool for uh, disinformation and for creating hate and for creating the sort of divisions uh, that were uh, giving rise to terrorism in Pakistan. So state's response uh, to dealing with terrorism is what really brought in legal regulations um, in the beginning. And now more and more that's being used to uh, suppress political dissent and the same regulation um, that, that was first started to sort of safeguard the society from the spread of terrorism is now really being used for political purposes and other purposes. Also, one needs to understand before understanding Pakistan's context is that Pakistan has had a peculiar uh, democratic model in which uh, more than 70 years in our history, we've had military governments, we've, got, we've, we've had dictatorships, and military remains a very powerful uh, actor in, in, in sort of states uh, working of its governance system. Um, that even though when military is not uh, actually in power, there's no martial law, um, it is behind the scene very, very active. So in Pakistan's democratic system is really best understood uh, as not, not just a democratically governed country, but a hybrid governance regime. Uh, so in order to be able to understand where we are, one needs to keep in mind our uh, background or our context of dealing uh, with terrorism and the fact that military continues to have a very, very important role um, in the way we govern ourselves. It's not a full democracy. It, it remains a major issue of uh, sort of transition for Pakistan, uh, but really uh, where we are at at the moment, even though we've had democratic um, sort of transfer of government from one to the other for the past uh, three governments, we remain a hybrid uh, uh, democracy model. Um, to move, move forward, the state's control is, as I said, it began in, in controlling terrorism. But those, so first state was actually protecting citizens from hate and, uh, you know, all the sort of the violence promotion that, that terrorist groups were doing. So the legal regime really began um, as, a, as, a, as a state's responsibility to safeguard the citizen uh, from, from that. So... There was a crackdown on the use of that uh, by militants. There was a crackdown because militants started using Facebook and uh, you know Twitter and others to actually spew hatred and all of that. So what is now happening uh, that uh, in, in sort of uh, uh, reviewing where legal regime is actually taking us in control of social media, uh, social rights and digital rights organizations believe that the legal regime, which is in place now, um, while we have been dealing with terrorism and it's effectively managed, uh, but the legal regime is too harsh. Uh, the punishments that are given uh, are not proportionate to crimes. And the, uh, now the legal regimes are there, so they are open to abuse by government. It's not just one particular government or today's government. It has been open to abuse by political governments earlier as well. Uh, it restricts freedom of expression and access to information for citizens. And what's the most uh, um, a sort of problematic issue of where we are at is that it is now, these, this legal regime is now uh, misused to target journalists, opinion leaders, whistleblowers, etc. Uh, so there's more and more uh, sort of self-censorship in media. Uh, there's more and more self-censorship in people who are opinion leaders. And the government has laws in place which are actually, um, you know, which are making it legally possible for the state to, to contact Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, to actually block and take away content that the state actually says is not right. And that content 
uh, from the citizen's perspective is not necessarily blasphemous or difficult, but it is still being used now for political purposes. Uh, so that's, that's really the state that we are at. Um, we've, uh, in fact, there's a, there's a law in place. Uh, it's Pakistan electro electronic uh, content law. Um, it actually gives state authorities uh, the, uh, the, uh, the right to remove unlawful content as they define it, um, uh, to block, to ask for its removal. And the list, and I'll just read out how wide that is and one can understand how it is open to abuse. Uh, so the list really, the, the law authorizes uh, Pakistan Telecommunication Authority to um, ask to remove or block any content that's against the glory of Islam, against the integrity, security, and defense of Pakistan, against public order, against contempt of court, against decency and morality, incitement of any offense, etc. It's a, it's, a, it's a very wide-ranging power uh, which now more and more is being used for political purposes. I need to bring in um, the, uh, there, there are, you know, there are many examples of, uh, even though the laws are in place, there is almost every month, there's a new effort to bring in more and more rules. Just in 2020, the government has tried to come in with citizen protection against online harm rules. But what's happening is that even though um, in, in sort of uh, the legal letter, these appear to be protecting citizens from uh, uh, sort of abuse and blasphemous content and hate and everything. But these are really used for partisan political purposes in curbing people's right um, of freedom and, and for, you know, sort of getting uh, information. I shared with you already the nexus of terrorism and security and how uh, the the entire concept of control and regulation of social media began. So when it began, um, it was, it, it's been really useful and it's worked greatly in, in managing uh, extremism and hate speech and all of that in Pakistan. But um, in, in Pakistan's governance model, where I shared with you that we are a hybrid governance model, uh, what military's own information um, sort of network is one of the strongest in the country because of the because of military's role in politics and democratic governance. And military's perspective can be best understood by uh, the way it packages the entire um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, narrative. So for Pakistan military or for security agencies, we've been hearing now that now that we've, uh, Pakistan has managed very well the war against terrorism, um, uh, the, the favorite phrase or the new term or the new narrative really is, uh, that comes out of security agencies is that Pakistan is facing fifth generation warfare or a hybrid warfare, which means that it's no longer a traditional war uh, that Pakistan is facing. Uh, it is really a war that is considered um, being waged against Pakistan by Pakistan's internal and external enemies, uh, which is on social media platform and on media platforms. So what has happened in Pakistan is uh, that the uh, control of traditional media, radio, television, newspaper, is almost complete. Uh, so the only opportunity that citizens had of any information or any expression is really now the social media. But as I said, it's now being used more and more to even curb freedom on social media. And this um, narrative in which Pakistan is told, or Pakistani citizens are told that they're supposed to be uh, we are, we are, uh, Pakistan is at the receiving end of a fifth generation or a hybrid warfare which is being waged on social media and elsewhere. Um, it's very uh, easy for people to understand that social media is actually considered by security operators or by the state as a potential tool for propaganda rather than a source of independent information that should hold powerful to the account. So this is really the context in which the entire control is uh, taking place. Uh, there is, there are now studies that are available that are there in, in on social media and even on traditional media, uh, how um, a state is using and political parties are, are using troll armies that are dominating conversations online, that are building narratives bordering on blatant disinformation. Um, I already talked about self-censorship by opinion leaders, journalists, and citizens. Um, a state, what it's doing now 
um, and I'm talking about the state, not not the political party in power. But state is now pushing dissenting voices to fringes because of this entire conversation that anyone who says anything um, for citizens' rights at the clock can now be termed as being anti-state. And that's a huge label. Uh, we had concerns uh, when voices like that, and Kosto will, will actually agree with me, when voices like that, the sort of dissent that was taking place in India, the way it was suppressed, that anyone who spoke against the ruling party in India um, would have, it's, it's a famous or a very, it's, it's a very cringeworthy sentence, but it's spoken to political opponents in, in, uh, um, in India that, okay, if you don't agree with us, move to Pakistan because you no longer are loyal to your state. Um, unfortunately, um, and Pakistan and India tend to have this um, very bad cosmic connection. And when something begins in India, um, it ends up being part of our dominant conversation as well. We somehow um, you know, affect each other's politics, not because of the relations between two countries, but we affect each other's politics that if there is extremism in Pakistan, we've seen that somehow that behavior has led to the behavior that's now in, uh, in India. Um, and we, we now see that if, if an extremist or um, any narrative that's used in India somehow ends up becoming, it's not sort of anti-India, but that same narrative somehow is picked up by our political discourse as well. And now we've started seeing this, uh, this, this sort of um, um, com comment now coming out of um, leading political parties now that if, if there is political dissent of any kind, uh, the leading line these days is that, okay, you should go to India if you do no longer agree with us on a, on a political issue. or a, So anti-state label is very easily dished out. But in the case of India, that anti-state label really is more political. In our case, what has, what has uh, started happening is that that anti-state label is coming both from the state and the ruling party at the same time. Um, where we're at in terms of social media, despite the control, despite everything, we're in the middle of a very strong uh, joint opposition campaign against uh, the, the leading or the ruling political party. Uh, but I can, I can just, and that example will actually tell uh, uh, the panelists the real story that no TV channel is actually allowed to broadcast live the political uh, meetings and the, you know, the political sort of uh, gatherings that opposition parties are holding. It is only um, social media where these things that, you know, telecast live, uh, sort of they're, they're placed on YouTube or Twitter or you used or something. And even then, just yesterday, we had a big political um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, gathering or a show of strength with all leading opposition parties were together. Um, and every effort was made, of course, no TV channel was showing anything live, but every effort was also made by the state to block internet, uh, to take down anything that appeared. So this is the sort of onslaught uh, that social media is facing in Pakistan and the impact that it's having on democracy Despite that control, um, uh, opposition parties and uh, you know people who wish to uh, sort of uh, you know express dissent are using you know more and more creative ways to say what they're supposed to say. Uh, but the, the sort of self censorship that we are now seeing um, is actually ma making the conversation very very difficult. Um, uh, we are a rights based organization. We work. Uh, in Pakistan on uh, you know, strengthening democracy and democratic governance. And I can very safely and openly uh, actually say uh, that we have to, the, the sort of um, uh, editorial activity that we have undergone ourselves in what we are publishing, um, what we used to publish and what we've continued to publish, but the sort of microscope review that we're now putting our own work under um, it, uh, which is, uh, you know, sort of coming from our own perspective is, is unprecedented. So that's, Asa, that's could really you, the... Could you yeah. wrap up in one minute? Yeah, yes, we are late. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that's, that's really where we are at, the nexus of social media. It's used, so despite control, despite um, a sort of state issues, uh, the, way, the, the kind of democracy that we are, um, it still is the most important um, tool available to citizens and for political dissent, etc. 
um, we do need to have, and I'd, I'd agree with most participants here who've spoken before me, that there is need for a greater effort by citizens, by organizations like us to understand the use of social media for faking popularity um, in elections, in uh, the, the, the larger problem of political finance on social media and how that's going to work out. So that's, uh, that, that, that is sort of the future of w what we are looking at uh, because it's, a, it's certainly a fight which is based on citizens' rights and citizens' rights to expression uh, and information. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Asiya. Yeah, thank you for your thorough discussion of the topic in Pakistan. I think you, Pakistan present a very interesting topic that uh, because the authoritarian control is so tightly, so uh, the social media is so essential to ordinary people and civil society organization. It become the only space for them to discuss or share or read the news. And uh, so the despite the negative impact by the government and the probably some conservative religious organization, social media is also critical to civil society organizations. So it's, we, miss, we must uh, strike a delicate balance between the two. And now we move to the Q&A section. I'm going to open the floor. Actually, we already have several questions. And uh, so first, uh, I will uh, uh, choose, pick up some questions. First, they, there's a question from uh, South Korea to to Makio about uh, the uh, the the, uh, the the influence of China. He mentioned if there's a uh, algorithm criteria and uh, whether those China generated news appear in the Yahoo or in the main uh, mass media, is there a criteria? And uh, are those uh, mm, fake news or misinformation, they are built on already tense the relation between the two sides. And they mean the, in Japan, they already some people, they don't like Korea's recent uh, reaction to Japan. So those uh, those uh, misinformation actually serve to like uh, exaggerate the 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 antagonism. Not really itself is the sources. Thank you very much for the question. Well, that's uh, that. Those are wonderful questions. Um, first of all, um, I would say that uh, the, the way CCP controls um, Record China is by providing news resources. Um, and um, well, Record China mostly uses news resources from Chinese state uh, media. Um, and those Japanese news um, providers, uh, well, seemingly Japanese news providers, which are actually um, controlled by CCP, and also um, diaspora media. And um, well, interestingly enough, um, for example, um, Record China uh, often um, puts up um, news from China Radio International, CRI, directly from them um, as if it were um, their news. And um, the same is conducted by those seemingly Japanese news providers that provide um, Chinese news. So well, all, they, uh, all of them share the contents, the same news contents uh, created by um, CCP uh, related news sites. And uh, regarding the uh, Yahoo Japan, um, well, I cannot um, deny for the 100% that um, any aggregator uh, will would not um, pick up um, anti-Korean news. Um, indeed, um, those shocking contents um, tend to be taken up by aggregator sites. So um, those news about um, diplomatic tensions um, often get um, released, dissem disseminated. However, um, especially when it comes to Yahoo Japan and some decent um, aggregator sites like MSN News, um, they have already um, terminated um, the contract with um, Record China. 
Um, and um, similar um, due to the, um, probably due to the um, rise of the anti-Korea um, contents. And similar thing happened in the past with um, other um, news sources as well. So um, um, while those news aggregators um, play the role of disseminating um, pro-China contents, but at the same time, some dissent uh, uh, news aggregators pl play the important role of gate gatekeeping. Okay, thanks, Makio. So next is a question about the uh, about the uh, media literacy education. How could we do that? Uh, could uh, Kustov, could you answer? Because we mentioned the media literacy education problem. Well, at least from the Indian context, uh, uh, it's extremely important. I think this is also applicable to all other contexts. Uh, although uh, the, the situation is such that uh, there is there is a high internet penetration, um, the number of uh, social media users is also quite high, um, but uh, the, the the responsible use of internet uh, internet and the social media platform uh, that has been the issue, uh, and therefore uh, the role of civil society organizations educational institutions and mainstream media uh, become so important. Um, I think uh, it, it needs to be done in a, in a continuous basis. Um, and uh, it's not only, as I, as I mentioned in my presentation, it's not only uh, what is right or what is wrong. It's not black and white. Many a times, because of this subjective interpretation, um, you know, the, the propagator's motive is to confuse people or bring uh, sort of uh, uh, distorted uh, um, uh, 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 historical facts. Um, and, and so, so it's, it's, it's not that it is, it is a, 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 a correct fact or incorrect fact, um, but that narrative has to be uh, uh, spoken and, and, and told. Uh, by alternative uh, uh, channels. So there the role of civil society becomes more important. But what is uh, uh, also possible is to work with the uh, existing technology pl platforms, uh, with the fact checkers um, and, and educational institutions and mainstream media to uh, work together uh, and, and, and uh, 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 you know, provide an opportunity for uh, civic education. Um, so that's the that's the point I I would suggest that we might we might consider. Jinan. Okay, thank you. Uh, last question because we have time limit. Last question is about how can government collaborate to fight uh, misinformation. Probably I will invite uh, Shu Zhong Li or any to give some response. Thank you, Jinan. Well, uh, I guess inside Asia, the countries can collaborate as uh, if we look at the cases of uh, EU's uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, EU uh, has legislated this, uh, this uh, law and reinforced it uh, in 2018 in order to protect private data. So therefore, uh, regardless of uh, you stay in Europe or outside Europe, if you are European, you can um, get the compensation by charging tech companies who uh, had neglected to, uh, you know, sort out this uh, sensitive uh, the private data. So I think we need a certain uh, principle and, and kind of compensation regulations uh, and, and GDPR emphasizes, for example, that we need to limit the purpose of uh, data and uh, we need to limit the storage of uh, private data and all this accuracy uh, and also accountability principles. So I guess uh, by applying this kind of things, we can um, protect the private data and also for the, the aggressor who are producing, generating the fake news, we need to um, strengthen um, the governmental 
policy as well as the private, uh, the civil society actors. I'm looking at very interesting case of a civic hacker, civic hacker movement. And the hacker has a negative connotations, but this time civic hacker is uh, citizens, uh, you know, voluntarily uh, solving the the social problems by providing certain maps and applications. So why civic hackers, you know, have uh, this kind of uh, role in sorting out what is fake news and what are not? So they can be a very good source uh, in responding to this fake news uh, and this information from from civil society sector. Uh, we. We probably have some time for the last speaker to respond. Probably, uh, do we, do Professor Magno, do you want to respond to this question about how can government collaborate to respond to, to reduce the misinformation? Uh, I, I would answer, answer that specifically, but maybe some of the questions refer to uh, how do we address uh, fake news? Uh, yeah. Is it through the social media platform or through other platforms? So I think it's a combination of addressing it through the social media platform, through uh, regulations. Uh, but uh, we have to, to be very careful because we also want uh, freedom, uh, freedom of speech. So I would say that uh, I think there is more uh, headway if we emphasize civic education because uh, it's really those individuals who uh, are uh, easily swayed by uh, by hyper partisanship and certainly because uh, your digital tools uh, uh, are informed by uh, algorithm and then when you like something, then uh, every information that is given your way is all about the things that you like. So that, uh, therefore, that diminishes the idea of free thinking. And I think it goes back to education and uh, civic education and appreciation of facts. And, uh, it's really triangulation of data and uh, uh, being able to appreciate all sorts of information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so let's come to the conclusion of this webinar. We have a very interesting and uh, constructive discussion of the issue. And uh, we also deal with some uh, important possible solution to address this uh, issue. So I only want to address uh, in add one thing that's the, if when it comes to address the misinformation, probably the importance of uh, independent uh, court agencies uh, is also, I think also very important. Like in Taiwan in past two years, there are many cases of misinformation charge and uh, sent by the police and uh, mostly target the opposition party. But uh, I think the court play a very important role in checking if those information are uh, mis misinformation charge are really valid. So I probably we should also pay attention to the, the role of court. And also we mentioned the role of mass media before. So I think the, the, those two organizations are also important to address the issue of misinformation. And I want to thank you all for participating in this uh, great event. And I hope I see you next time soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.